the European arrest warrant has served us well, is a threat and does ensure that justice can be done wherever possible. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move to the next item of business, which is a stage three proceedings on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill is amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 47A. The marshalled list, that is SP Bill 47AML. The groupings, that is SP Bill 47AG. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. And I now call Group 1, Historic Environment Scotland Functions, promoting the maintenance of the historic environment. I call Amendment Number 1, in the name of Liam MacArthur and a group of its own. Liam MacArthur to move and speak to Amendment Number 1. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Committee colleagues will recall that at Stage 2, uh, I lodged the move various amendments reflecting a range of concerns I had at that time, many born of the experience of um, constituents uh, in my own Orkney uh, constituency. Whether it was a desire uh, to avoid historic environment Scotland, taking an overly centralised approach, ensuring it respects and involves local expertise, or working back the other way, a determination that local councils should be able to continue accessing advice and guidance from HES to help them fulfil their own statutory functions. In each instance, I believe uh, the undertakings, the assurances offered by the Cabinet Secretary were adequate and, and, and helpful. As for the risks associated with HES achieving charitable status and the potential for conflicts of interest or concerns that staff and resources may be focused away from current functions and towards revenue raising, only time will tell. I'm not convinced, however, that amending the bill would achieve the desired aim, uh, though these are certainly issues that the Committee uh, for the Duration of this Parliament and indeed successor committees will wish to keep under review. Where I do believe the bill would still benefit from change, however, is in relation to the functions of HES. This was an issue raised initially by the Law Society, to whom I'm grateful. Subsequently, friends of Seafield House in South Ayrshire have highlighted a specific example of why this issue needs to be re revisited and hopefully, hopefully addressed in the bill. Uh, I will indeed, yeah. Chair Brodie. Two, uh, about two D and E, where it's protecting and managing the historic environment as per a, a line D, and conserving and enhancing the historic environment. Can you tell me where your amendment actually adds to that? Well, I think Chick Brodie, who I know has been in fairly regular contact with the Friends of Seafield House, will be aware of their specific concerns and that the way in which preserve and conserve do not actually reflect um, the adequate needs uh, of that particular instance, where, as I understand it, the local health board has not been prepared uh, to uh, maintain the uh, fabric of a building uh, that the uh, Friends of Seafield House are looking uh, to, uh, to take over in due course. At stage two, my amendment sought to separate the conserve and enhance functions of HES, recognising that these could be incompatible in some circumstances. This time, uh, I'm looking in section two to add a requirement on HES to promote the maintenance of the historic environment. The Law Society supports this. So too, as Chick Brodie will be aware, does Rob Close, chair of the Friends of Seafield House, based on their experience trying to save a building owned, as I say, by the local health board. As Mr Close explains in his letter to me, one I think probably shared with Chick Brodie, the word maintenance has a much more practical meaning. It is a word that talks directly to owners who are not minded to conserve or preserve. He goes on to quote from our place in time, the historic environment strategy, which refers repeatedly to the need to maintain or for maintenance, as well as the benefits of, quote, a well-maintained environment. Mr Close uh, argues that having the word maintaining in addition to protecting and conserving would cover situations where the public private owner is not minded to protect or conserve, but to bring about the demise of a building for economic reasons. He adds uh, that giving Hess this function would allow the fabric of a building to be maintained while its fate is being decided, thereby helping those local communities who I know the Cabinet Secretary, like me, is very keen to see becoming more directly and actively involved in the historic environment, help them potentially to save a much-valued building. 
Other colleagues, uh, like Chip Brody, representing that part of the country, will be more familiar with the details of the Seafield House campaign. And I would not presume uh, to judge the actions either the Local Health Board or the Council, I believe, have refused to serve a repair notice. Nevertheless, I do think it offers a specific example of the sort of benefit my amendment could help deliver. I know the Cabinet Secretary was sceptical at stage two, but hope that having had time to reflect further and consider this specific example, um, but there will be undoubtedly others in other parts of the country, uh, I would encourage her to now support my amendment, which I am pleased to move. Many thanks. Now, Colin Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think Mr MacArthur makes a, a good point about an issue that has been consistently debating in this bill, and that's the need to ensure that the principle of streamlining the care of our historic environment within a single body does not override the importance of local decision-making and community responsibility and individual responsibility, as they have an essential role to play in that care of the environment. This, in turn, I think, has led to a very interesting semantic debate about the meaning of the words conserve, preserve and maintain, uh, perhaps that's on a very pedantic level at uh, one uh, aspect, but I do actually think it's hugely significant uh, when it comes to the detail of this, so I will be supporting uh, Mr MacArthur's amendment. Thanks. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I too rise to support Liam MacArthur's amendment, which I think is eminently sensible in the, the circumstances we face. I'm sure we all know of historic and important buildings, indeed, in our own areas, which, for the lack of maintenance, have been impossible to conserve. I think it's entirely sensible that we do look to make the definitions as clear as we possibly can and understand what it is we are trying to do. But I would just repeat, Deputy Presiding Officer, if buildings of a historic or important nature are not maintained, then the opportunity to conserve them for the good of communities can well be lost. It's important the word is there. Many thanks. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Amendment 1 seeks to give Historic Environment Scotland a particular function of promoting the, the maintenance of the historic environment. I think the emphasis on the word promoting, uh, having heard the contributions from members, it's not actually the delivery of the maintenance that's mentioned in, in the uh, amendment. There has been detailed consultation and deliberation over the functions of HES functions, and this is why there is widespread agreement uh, amongst stakeholders that the functions should be defined at a high level. And there have been a great deal of deliberations that uh, uh, delivered uh, the functions that you see before you in the bill as part of the consensus that was uh, developed in, in developing the bill. And this amendment would actually undermine the consensus that was achieved in identifying what the functions should be of the new organisation. There is also agreement that HES needs, to, needs freedom uh, within its operating remit to, to decide how best to deliver and that there needs to be space for its approach to de develop over time. And I believe those positions are correct. I do not wish to disrupt them. The bill should set out the overall task for HES in broad terms, not offer a, a detailed catalogue of the contents of the toolkit it will deploy. Promoting maintenance is already fully covered by HES's general function of investigating, caring for and promoting Scotland's historic environment and also its particular functions of managing and conserving the historic environment. Historic Scotland already does a, a broad range of work in this area. It is active in promoting maintenance, for example, through the development of the traditional building skills strategy, as well as the traditional building health check initiative. I launched the pilot for the health check scheme in Stirling two years ago. It aims to promote active, uh, proactive building repair and maintenance to stimulate demand for skilled tradespeople and is being led in collaboration with Stirling Council and with the Construction Industry Training Board. And HES will continue that work. So, in short, I don't for a moment dispute that maintenance is crucial, as Patricia Ferguson has said, and it's a, as a means of ensuring the long-term preservation of our historic environment. The fact is in, not in doubt anywhere in the sector. However, I believe the amendment could pose, pose problems for HES and more widely. Being so specific about promoting maintenance could unbalance HES's functions that have been deliberated on and we've achieved consensus. It might, for example, lead to the impression that promoting maintenance is more important than demonstrating maintenance on the properties HES will manage on Minister's behalf or supporting maintenance through its grants programmes. And I would also note that local authorities already have strong powers to take action in respect of listed buildings which are being neglected by their owners, including repair notices, compulsory purchase and the 
the power to make repairs to unoccupied buildings and recover costs. So giving HES a function of promoting maintenance would not strengthen these powers. Worse, it might create confusion by implying that HES is in some way directly responsible for the maintenance of listed buildings in private ownership. In conclusion, I do not believe that inserting the particular function for Historic Environment Scotland to promote maintenance of the historic environment would improve the bill, and therefore, Presiding Officer, I do not support this amendment. Thank you very much. I now call on Liam MacArthur to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment. Mr MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking uh, Liz Smith for her support, uh, as indeed at stage uh, two she supported a similar amendment uh, at that point. Can I also thank uh, Patricia Ferguson for her comments. I think she was right to uh, point to the fact that this is an issue that uh, will probably affect uh, communities uh, in instances across uh, the country and that without uh, maintenance, uh, the option of preserving it is really, really rather difficult to achieve. The Cabinet Secretary talked about the consultation and deliberations. I, I don't doubt that for, for a second. And, but she talks about the potential for creating confusion or undermining a consensus. Well, I, I haven't been uh, contacted by anybody who suggested to me that the amendment I've, I, I've lodged and I'm moving uh, was at risk of unravelling a consensus. The contrary, I've had the Law Society in touch with me to express their continued support for this amendment. And in addition, friends of, of Seafield, I think, have provided a very helpful example of why this particular loophole in the, uh, in, in the functions of, of, of HES um, should uh, and, and could be addressed uh, at this uh, stage. So, uh, on the basis of, of what I've heard, uh, on the uh, representations I've received, I'm convinced that this amendment is necessary to the bill, and therefore we're pressing it. Thank you. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a division, and this will be a five-minute division as it's the first stage, first division of the bill. Uh, sorry. There will be a five-minute suspension until we vote.
We will now proceed with the division on amendment number one. This is a 30-second division, so members should cast their votes now, please. The result of the vote in amendment number one is yes, 45, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I we'll now move to group two, and I call amendment two in the name of Liz Smith, group with amendment three. Liz Smith, to move amendment two and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move amendment two in my name. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary said in her uh, opening comments at both stages one and two that the Scottish Government's policy position from the start has been that the new body should be regulated and that it should be fully transparent and subject to the highest uh, quality of external scrutiny uh, that the Commissioner can provide. And the Cabinet Secretary has herself, I think, been fully transparent in her own approach and I think we all uh, commend her for that. Yet I think there are uh, some remaining issues, most especially those which relate to accountability and the possible conflict of interest between HESE's regulatory function and its ability uh, to seek grants and to carry out some of the work uh, related to them. And the Cabinet Secretary will know that uh, in between uh, stages two and three, the Law Society of Scotland has reiterated its concerns about the possible conflict of interest, specifically those conflicts which could arise if HES is awarding grants at the same time as seeking others in its role as a charity. And it questions whether some aspects of that regulatory role can be sitting comfortably with charitable status. At stage two, however, the Cabinet Secretary seemed to uh, intimate that the bill will not actually create these tensions, but I do believe that there remains a little bit of an issue here, and it is one about the final accountability, which is the reason for amendments two and three, because they are specific to the concerns about the accountability in these situations, albeit very likely uh, to be rare, where the board members of HES might express disquiet about some aspects of Scottish Government strategy on a general term. And that issue, I don't think, has gone away. Indeed, I think uh, perhaps we could have had a little bit more engagement by the government uh, to uh, stakeholders on this issue. The Cabinet Secretary was very clear in the letter that uh, she sent to the convener of the Education Committee on the 28th of May that if Scottish ministers did not think HES was playing a sufficiently strong role in addressing matters of concern to the wider cultural sector as captured in that strategy, then they would direct uh, the board. And therefore, that confirms that there is ministerial uh, direction. And I think that's quite separate, as the Cabinet Secretary has said many times herself, from operational independence of the body. But it does naturally draw into question what could happen, uh, and the Cabinet Secretary was clear that there might be situations where there could be a disagreement. So I think, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that there are still some issues uh, about this and that we could do with some extra uh, safeguards. So that is why I'm moving Amendment 2 in my name. Many thanks. Cabinet Secretary. As I confirmed at stage two, the corporate plan is a vital document and Liz Smith is right to recognise its primacy. Um, I share her sentiment that the corporate plan must have the highest status and must offer certainty for heads in planning its work. And that is precisely why we have provided uh, explicitly in this bill for HES to create such a plan and for its approval by ministers. That explicit provision goes a step beyond the establishing legislation for analogous bodies such as the National Library of Scotland and Scottish National Heritage, where we haven't actually done that. The corporate plan is the foundation of the corporate performance framework for HES. Ministers will approve it, which means we will share ownership and accountability for its delivery with HES. The plan and any revisions will be public documents. The performance report for the organisation will be published, at least annually. So any failure to deliver will be transparent, as will the the reasons given for failure. The ministerial power for direction is there for good reasons. It can be used in a positive way to support HES by, for example, clarifying procedural matters such as routine sponsorship arrangements and how they will work. Again, as I remarked during stage two, a similar amendment, there seems to be an assumption that ministers will be issuing directions to HES on a regular basis and to do things which HES feels are not wise. And I repeat that ministers of this government will not act in, in this way. 
In seven years as a minister, I cannot recall ever issuing a direction in opposition to the advice of a sponsored body, and such an action is rare across the, the whole of government. A formal direction, especially one against the advice of a sponsored body, is the end of a long process of discussion, never the starting point. In any case, the chair and the board of an NDPB do not require a specific provision to raise a challenge uh, to any proposals that would significantly compromise delivery of uh, agreed outcomes. And indeed, they could engage the parliament and committee and, and MSPs if such was the case. It is in the nature of the role and the normal sponsorship relationship between government and NDPBs that such matters are explored and resolved long before any formal communication or direction takes place. And for these reasons, I believe that the amendments that are put forward will simply introduce unnecessary complications, provide legislative micromanagement into the clear and straightforward relationship centred on the uh, corporate plan. I understand the sentiment that Liz Smith um, is, is coming uh, with our amendments to Parliament with, but I, I, I do think that they aren't necessary in relation to how good governance and good government works. And I, I, I think the amendments are unnecessary, and I continue to oppose them as I did at stage two. Thank you very much. Uh, Liz Smith to wind up and press a withdrawal amendment, please. Uh, thank you. I will uh, press uh, the amendment. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I, I do hear what you say, and uh, I... Uh, I think I began by complimenting you on your, your own transparency in this, and I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that uh, this kind of problem has not arisen, but uh, I refer you back to uh, the uh, transcript of stage two when you did admit that there could be a situation where there might be a disagreement. Uh, and while I'm well aware that obviously there is public scrutiny of the corporate plan that um, the Cabinet Secretary could be brought before uh, the uh, committee, that scrutiny obviously exists. But I think that comes after a problem is identified. What I'm trying to drive at is to try and stop the problem happening in the first place. And I just think we need that extra dimension of scrutiny at that stage. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a division. This will be a one-minute division. Please cast your votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number two is yes, 44, no, 65. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment three in the name of Liz Smith, already debated with amendment two. Liz Smith, to move or not? Not moved. Many thanks. And so we now move to group three. And I call amendment four in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group amendment five, Cabinet Secretary, to move amendment four and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Uh, these uh, technical amendments relate to the prescribing by order of persons who can manage properties in care or collections on behalf of ministers. The bill, as introduced, included powers to delegate the care and management of the properties in care and associated collections to Historic Environment Scotland and also to delegate those functions to other persons. This is to allow for future flexibility in arrangements to ensure the long-term preservation of the properties in care. In their stage one report, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee recommended that where ministers were delegating their powers to persons other than HES, this should be subject to parliamentary scrutiny. The job of looking after these properties for the nation is a very important one, and I was happy to agree that any persons who would take this on should be uh, subject to the appropriate scrutiny. At stage two, I proposed amendments uh, requiring that ministers prescribe by order any persons to whom functions could be delegated in line with the committee's recommendations. These these amendments are needed to complete that intention by ensuring that the affirmative procedure is required for such orders, as the committee and I are agreed it should be. And I am movements, uh, move amendments four and five. 
Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. So I now call Amendment 5 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 4. Cabinet Secretary to move formally, please. Uh, formally moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Thank you very much. So I now call Amendment 6 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. At group 4, uh, grouped with Amendments 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 6 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Uh, this group of six amendments relates to the powers available to ministers to ensure that the outcome of a successful appeal is given effect to by HES. The amendments relate to appeals under new Section 1C of the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act, challenging a decision by HES to include a monument on the schedule of ancient monuments. New Section 5B of the Planning, Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas, Scotland Act 1997, challenging a decision of HES to include a building on the list of listed buildings, and uh, section 19 of the 1997 Act, challenging a decision uh, of a planning authority to refuse consent. A ground of appeal may be that the building ought not to be included on the list. These appeals will enable a challenge to be made against inclusion on the schedule or on the list. The provisions in the bill as it stands do not enable ministers to direct heads to remove a property from the schedule or list following a successful appeal. These amendments ensure that this is the case and that the power available to ministers following the determination of appeals are consistent with the powers available in relation to other appeal procedures. It is, of course, important that ministers have full powers to ensure that effect is given to a successful appeal. I should say that the power of direction is a safeguard, since HES will naturally be expected to do whatever is required after an appeal without a direction from ministers. I therefore move Amendment 6. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. I now call Amendments 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated, and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 7 to 11 on block, please. Move, moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 7 to 11? As it appears, no member does do. As no member does, the question is that Amendments 7 to 11 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. So thank you very much. And that ends consideration of a And so we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11378 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would invite members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly, please, as I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, uh, nine minutes, please. Uh, for the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, I wish to advise the Parliament that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purport of the Historic Environment Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interests, so far as they are affected by the Bill, at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. As we uh, begin the last stage in Parliament's consideration of this bill to establish a new lead body for the historic environment, I want to thank the many people who have contributed to a very positive process. We have seen constructive engagement from MSPs and from many stakeholders who have all recognised the importance and potential of Scotland's historic environment and the need to work together to protect it and to develop its potential. I particularly want to express my appreciation of the staff of Historic Scotland and RCAMS for their patience and professionalism in dealing with the process of transition. I met with their joint uh, senior management team earlier today and was impressed by the commitment and expertise that both bodies are bringing in the process of pre preparing for their rebirth as uh, Historic Environment Scotland. There is a, a rewarding future ahead for all staff and I know that they are ready to get on with the job. And I'd also like to re recognise the hard work of the officials of the Scottish Government who have been central to translating our ambitions into the bill we are considering today and for their hard work and dedication and also for the committee of this parliament uh, for their scrutiny. The historic environment lies at the heart of our, our cultural identity. It plays a, a key role in defining who we are and our place in the world. It tells Scotland's story. It has intrinsic and instrumental value over and above any economic considerations. It merits our most careful stewardships for those reasons alone. And the contribution of the heritage sector to economic life is certainly important, but for me is a secondary benefit. 
Heritage already makes a, a major contribution. A cautious estimate has suggested that Scotland's historic environment contrib contributes well over £2 billion annually to our economy and supports over 40,000 jobs in the tourism and building sectors. And there's no reason why it can't offer much more in terms of its social value as well as in monetary terms. To deliver that potential requires all partners to work together in a collaborative way and within a strategic framework. I've spoken before about Scotland's first ever historic environment strategy, which has been published as the document Our Place in Time. And Our Place in Time provides a shared vision and a strategic framework for all parts of the historic environment sector to work collaboratively to achieve its full potential. Collaboration is not new to the sector, but what is new is an explicit and widely shared framework for the long term. This new way of working will drive more effective partnership working delivering real and increasing benefits to the people of Scotland. And I can report that the strategy is moving forward well. The initial working groups have been established and confirmed their remits, and several have already met. I can also report that all but one of the groups are led by senior stakeholders from beyond historic, uh, Scotland and Arkhams. That, that is, uh, I think, a, a genuine shared endeavour uh, being demonstrated. The Scottish Government's contribution to this shared enterprise will be taken forward by Historic Sc uh, Environment Scotland, the body that this bill will establish. And we're bringing resources, skills and experience together into one newly body. They are simplifying the processes by which our most important historic environment assets are protected and managed. We're providing more transparency to legislation which can seem complex and confusing. And both Historic Scotland and Arkhams um, have been with us for many years and have driven forward many fantastic projects. And if anyone doubts this, look, at, look in uh, Arkhams archives, archives at some of the before and after photographs of the Great Hall of Stirling Castle and see how much has been done there by Historic Scotland. And remember that Arkhams has made these uh, images uh, accessible online and, uh, uh, far more than, uh, uh, than you can imagine uh, anywhere uh, accessible in the world. And I particularly like the fact that as they protect and record the, record the past, the bodies are pioneering innovative uses for new technology in their everyday works. They do this in headline projects such as the Scottish 10, which continues to receive plaudits from around the world for its innovative approach. The Nagasaki giant cantilever crane will be the last of 10 iconic landmarks to be digitally scanned by uh, the Scottish 10 team and designed and built in Scotland. The crane is a major landmark in Nagasaki Harbour and is still in use and the first pictures uh, went online yesterday if you want to have a look at them. Uh, new technology is also central to the work which is ongoing to address energy efficiency in traditional buildings, which is vital to ensuring our historic environment contributes to our ambitious climate change commitments. And that is exactly the kind of approach that we need to realise uh, the determination that our historic uh, environment must become part of the solution and not part of the problem across the widest possible range of policy areas. And the complementary nature of the two bodies has long been recognised. They both work well and they often work well together. And I believe formally bringing them together is the logical step. And I'm delighted that members have agreed with me um, uh, on, on this uh, issue. This government's vision is not just about merging staff and functions, it's far more than this. This is part of a fundamental transformation across the whole sector. This new approach requires a single lead body which will work collaboratively with other bodies in the sector to ensure that the historic environment contributes more effectively to a range of other policy areas, including placemaking, tourism and regeneration, which all contribute to our well-being uh, for our nation and our people. And HES will lead our efforts to achieve a step change in recognition for our historic environment and its potential. At the same time, I'm very clear that this bill is to create a lead body, not a command body. There are areas where it is right that a national body has lead responsibility, for example, in protecting our most important sites and buildings by statutory designation. Even there, HES will continue to work with local authorities to ensure change is managed appropriately and sensitively. And likewise, it is right that HES will act as a consultation authority in planning and environmental regulation to ensure that our historic environment is not needlessly damaged by the pursuit of other objectives. And the Scottish Government has already made real progress in mainstreaming the historic environment into wider policy development at a national level. HES has a larger task of taking the case for mainstreaming out into society. It will need to persuade and educate, perhaps even cajole or contest. But the mission of its staff will be to convince everyone that the historic environment matters and deserves respect and attention. 
And that mission, of a course, is underpinned by wider principles set out in international charters and conventions, and of course, the Scotland's historic environment policy. HES will proceed on the basis of agreed principles, such as the value of maintenance and the desirability of sustainable reuse of historic buildings where appropriate, such as seeking to understand the full cultural significance of heritage assets before we decide on their future care and use, and principles such as sharing knowledge. The Bill sets out HES's functions in broad terms. We have chosen not to offer a detailed catalogue of the methods which HES will bring to bear, not least because new methods are constantly emerging. I will expect HES itself to play a role in developing new approaches, as Historic Scotland and RCAMS have done so successfully to date. And the Bill places crystal clear responsibilities on HES to exercise all of its functions and to deploy all of its resources to one end, to support our historic environment and to work with everyone who wants to contribute to that task. I believe Historic Environment Scotland can and will be a body which can lead and contribute in full measure to our national strategic vision. I believe this bill puts in place appropriate functions and powers for HES which will allow the new body to flourish but retain proper oversight uh, by ministers and parliament. And I know that the staff who will go forward to form HES are ready and eager for the challenge and that the sector as a whole welcomes these changes. It is with confidence, therefore, Presiding Officer, that I move that Parliament approve the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. Many thanks. I now call on Patricia Ferguson. Uh, six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking the Education and Culture Committee for their work on this bill, soon to be an Act of Parliament, and for their very thorough scrutiny of it. I'm obviously not a member of that committee, but I have watched their deliberations with great interest. And I would also extend my thanks to the committee clerks, who I know have been uh, professional in their support of the committee going forward. The Minister said, uh, sorry, the Cabinet Secretary said, and she was correct to do so, that our historic environment tells Scotland's story. But it also tells the story of every community in every part of Scotland and is valuable to us for that and for the sense of place it gives to us. But it is also valuable in the sense that it is perhaps our um, most green resource in the way that it can be recycled over time, uh, changing function or retaining a function over many decades or perhaps even over many centuries. So its importance to us cannot be underestimated in, or overestimated, I should say, in my view. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary has responded very constructively to many of the committee's concerns about this particular piece of legislation, and that is, of course, very welcome indeed. I think, too, when we talk about local interest, we have to remember that our local authorities have a very important role to play here. And I hope that the new body will help to support those local authorities. It seems to me that heritage and the historic environment are rarely at the top of their agenda, perhaps understandably in this time of shrinking budgets. But I do think that they need to be encouraged and supported in taking forward their vital part of this particular and very important jigsaw. I do think that the bill itself would have benefited from uh, Liam MacArthur's amendment because I think that we often rush to conserve those buildings that are already so neglected but are so important to us that we mustn't allow them to disappear that we forget that there have been perhaps five, ten, perhaps decades when those buildings have been allowed to drop out of a maintenance cycle and have suffered as a consequence and our actions at the last minute if they are successful, are often costly. And of course, there are occasions when a building might just be too far gone for it to be able to be saved. Although fortunately, with uh, the kind of technology we have nowadays, with the resurgence in the kind of traditional skills that are needed for these buildings, then perhaps that will less be the case in the future. Um, regarding ministerial direction, I'm very pleased that ministers have not taken the power of direction to mean that they can give direction regarding any particular historic property uh, collection or object for that matter, um, other than for properties and care of course. And I'm very pleased about that as I say because I think to have done so would actually have been to take a step too far. And if there is one problem that I, I still have 
with the bill. It is about the future of the Historic Scotland Foundation and about this Grand Trust. I'm not clear how they are expected to operate beyond the point of merger. And it seems to me that those two organisations might be left in, in limbo, as I could find no specific reference as to the future that the Scottish Government envisaged for them. And it would be helpful just to have a little bit of information about that. Perhaps not the most pressing matter in connection with this bill, but one that I think um, perhaps just needs to be tidied up, I suppose. And I am pleased, talking of tidying up, that the Scottish Government has taken the opportunity to tidy up some of the existing legislation already in place through the, the good offices of this bill. And I would mention specifically the provision which allows there to be an exclusion to the listing of a building. That will, I think, help to focus uh, what it is that's important about a building. It helps us to consider what elements of a structure are valuable to us and which are perhaps for example, later additions that perhaps don't need to be uh, considered in quite the same way or with quite the same level of protection. And I think it will also help those tasked with managing those buildings to ensure that their efforts are directed where they are most needed and not perhaps dissipated over too many issues. Of course, that provision will only apply to listings in the future, as I understand it, and not to those buildings previously listed. But again, I think there is understandable reasons for that. I mentioned that our historic environment gives us a sense of place and it does more than that because for many people uh, our historic environment may include their home, their place of worship or a community facility that is of great importance to them. And I very much hope and I sense that this particular bill will help us to make sure that these structures are maintained and enhanced and conserved as we go forward. In closing, presiding officer, as I must only too quickly do, I would want to pay particular tribute to Diana Murray of Arkhams and Ian Walford of Historic Scotland. Mergers such as this are never easy, but they have gone about their task with real professionalism and in a way which I think has been successful in retaining the confidence of their staff and their boards through what could have been a very difficult process. And speaking of their boards, I would want to particularly mention Professor John Hume not just because of his professional reputation prior to joining historic, uh, Arkham's in his particular role, but also because he has literally gone out and photographed and recorded places of interest himself. And he has done that over a long period of time and has contributed hugely to the work of the organisation. And of course, the staff of the two organisations are also being con congratulated. I wish, presiding officer, the new organisation and all its stakeholders the very best for their future. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Liz Smith. Four minutes, please. Thank you, <coughs> presiding officer. And could I add my thanks to the committee and to the committee clerks and reiterate the comments uh, from Patricia Ferguson about the staff, particularly the senior staff of the uh, two organisations. Um, the Scottish Conservatives very warmly welcome this bill, largely because of the logic uh, behind it is fundamentally uh, sound. By merging Historic Scotland and Arkham's, there will be an agency that is better equipped, I think, to uh, conserve and preserve and hopefully maintain, if, even if that is not formally uh, in the Act, uh, and enhance uh, Scotland's historic environment, particularly at what is a, a very challenging uh, time. That's not just from a financial perspective, but that's a curatorial one uh, too. Uh, that is not to say that either of the separate bodies has failed in its current duties. Uh, far from it, the Cabinet spoke, uh, Secretary spoke eloquently about the job that they have done, and that has been uh, remarkable. Indeed, I think Scotland can be extremely proud of its heritage and how it is managed, but there is clearly a consensus that a more strategic uh, and streamlined approach will further strengthen our historic environment sector. This year, uh, of all years, perhaps uh, has exposed the extraordinary interest uh, in Scotland's rich cultural heritage, something that I think perhaps we all take a bit too much for granted at times. And whilst it is a difficult uh, economic time, uh, it's hugely rewarding for, I think, the new cultural initiatives that the Cabinet Secretary spoke about. Now, that's not to say that there haven't been some issues along the way, particularly those of accountability and strategic direction, exactly what it means. Uh, I think Patricia Ferguson raised an interesting point about how uh, that direction relates to some of the other uh, bodies, um, and particularly when it comes to a national and uh, local uh, body interface. Each of these uh, have raised a little uh, in the way of uh, 
lack of clarity perhaps at times and I think it's been helpful to go through a process uh, particularly when there is the important issue of charitable status hopefully uh, to be uh, considered in the future. There obviously were be uh, questions about those who were ultimately responsible for uh, the direction of the corporate plan and I totally accept what the Cabinet Secretary is saying in terms of the way that that has been uh, delivered and debated so far. I uh, won't rehearse the arguments about amendments uh, two and three that we've just uh, had but I think there remains a bit of an issue about that and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will use her good offices to ensure that we don't enter uh, any other difficulties from that. As we know, there have been several stakeholders who have uh, raised issues about the charitable uh, status uh, and its application and how any future award of that charitable uh, status will exist at the same time as the regulatory role of HES and its need uh, to raise funds. And obviously, this is happening at a time when, uh, for other reasons, uh, people are questioning whether the strict charity test is applied in all different uh, areas, and that's something that was agreed very firmly by MSPs in 2005, uh, but there obviously are question marks about that. No doubt uh, funding issues will remain, even if that's not the primary function of this uh, Act. Uh, during the uh, committee hearings, we heard a lot about finance, both in terms of raising uh, the sufficient funds, but also in terms of the need for a coherent financial structure, which would not uh, disadvantage any one particular body. And the National Trust for Scotland uh, continues to raise the point that in future they'd be competing for funds with an organisation that they believe will obviously enjoy close working relationships with the Scottish uh, Government. And it's obviously inevitable, given the maintenance backlog and other uh, pressures that are associated with the Historic Environment Scotland, uh, that, uh, as I say, the financial issue, and I hope they, that the new strategic direction um, will be able to provide uh, a greater coherency to that decision-making when it comes to essential uh, finance. So, in summary, presiding officer, even if there were very significant areas, I think, of uh, concerns, the intentions of the bill have always uh, been sound, and on that basis, we are very happy uh, to support it. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. And I call on Claire Adamson to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. It's 10,000 years since Scotland's first encampment in Cramond when um, the house at Barnes Nest became our first um, built environment in 8,000 BC. Um, so I'll endeavour to cover those 10,000 years in four minutes. Presiding officer, I think it might be a, a difficult task today. Can I say, as a member of the Education and Culture Committee, it's been an absolute pleasure to be involved and participate in this bill process. It's given me an opportunity to engage with some of the most knowledgeable, enthusiastic and passionate people and organisations who work in this fascinating sector. And I pay tribute again to the stakeholders of Historic Scotland and the RCAMs who showed, their, showed us their works and their hopes for HES. And also, can I pay tribute to Chair Clarks, to the government officials, to our convener, and to the other members of the committee in their deliberations over the bill. I have to also highlight again the very informative committee visit to Orkney, um, where participants from Historic Scotland, Scottish Natural Heritage, the local authority archaeologists, came together um, to help the committee with their deliberations and help us understand their working practices. It was an excellent visit and provided a great example of partnership and collaboration that the, the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned is the ambition for moving forward for HES. Our environment is precious, our historic environment and buildings so important to who we are as a nation and to our journey to this point. We had a poignant and very sad uh, example of um, how precarious that heritage can be and how devastating it can be when we lose it because, of course, the fire at the Glasgow School of Art uh, happened while we were deliberating over the bill and uh, we all mourned the loss of the Macintosh Library. So I believe that this bill and the supporting strategy is the way forward for us to protect and preserve as best we can for future generations. The start, Scotland's historic environment is a vital resource, both cultural, social, but also in economic terms. Historic Environment Bill proposes the merger of Historic Scotland and RCAMS, bringing together these two um, organisations so that Scotland's historic environment can continue to be a vital resource in forming our culture, our social and economic terms, and that we should be, it should deliver great benefits for our communities. There was very strong consensus during the committee process among our members, and I was very glad to see that that continued albeit with some, some um, 
some amendments today that weren't passed, but I, I believe that you know the consensus that has been shown across this chamber is, is, is a very good tribute to the, the um, deliberations of the committee. The creation of a new national body for the historic environment will ensure the long-term effectiveness in the face of current and future challenges. It will sustain the functions of both Historic Scotland and RCAMS, ensuring that both organisations can deliver maximum public benefits and be resilient for the future. It will provide clarity of governance, striking the right balance, I believe, between professional, operational, independent and public accountability. It will improve and simplify the delivery of public services and capitalise on the strengths of both organisations and the synergies between them. Very little time, presiding officer, but can I just highlight how glad I was to hear the Cabinet Secretary talk about the skills required in maintaining the future of our historic environment. And I trust that HES will go on to continue to have a modern apprenticeship programme and the skills required for um, uh, stonemasonry and joinery in these very, very specialist areas. Historic Environment Scotland will act as a key partner in the delivery of the new strategy. A place or place and time. I would love to be able to talk about the key points of that. I've run out of time, presiding officer, but thank you very much for the, the opportunity this afternoon and I look forward to voting for this very important bill later this evening. Thanks very much. <clears throat> and I now call on Liam MacArthur, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I, like others, pay tribute to my uh, committee colleagues, to the witnesses that gave their evidence to the committee, uh, to the Cabinet Secretary and her officials, uh, but also to the staff of HES, uh, to Historic Scotland and RCAMS. Um, I'm particularly grateful uh, to my constituents in Orkney for hosting an excellent committee visit back in May, uh, one that I think demonstrated how the historic environment can shape the identity of a community, enrich the quality of life while also delivering real economic value, as the Cabinet Secretary suggested, and how a collaborative approach is the best, possibly the only effective way to maintain, enhance and promote that historic environment. It illustrates also why we must guard against centralisation, why the, this merger must not result in the entrenching of functions, people and decisions in the centre. Uh, people in communities across Scotland, uh, whether in a pro professional or voluntary capacity, are doing great things day in daily to protect, enhance and make accessible the historic environment in their area. And they need to be supported to continue doing so in ways that are inclusive and not seen as top down. By the same token, HES will be home to experts in highly technical and specialised subject areas. Access to this expertise is also vitally uh, important, particularly for local councils who are already under tremendous budgetary pressure and can't replicate this uh, in-house. And it's a point I think BEFS uh, make in their briefing. Again, on that point, while it's not for this bill, Parliament and Ministers will need to guard against any moves to shift resources within HES away from core functions to ones aimed more at, for example, revenue raising. Important though this is, it cannot come at the expense of some of the more technical and inevitably costly roles for which um, uh, Historic Scotland and, and RCAMS currently have responsibility. Similarly, while I'm supportive of efforts to ensure all parts of the country begin to value the historic uh, environment, I would caution against any move by HES to retreat from areas such as uh, Orkney, where excellent work already takes place, but where many other opportunities go unexplored due to limited resources. Scotland will not, to coin the Cabinet Secretary's expression, punch its weight in terms of the historic environment by hobbling those parts of the country that are currently already doing so. It was regrettable that my amendment uh, was rejected earlier on, so HES does not have a function to promote uh, the maintenance of the historic environment. Uh, it's a regret, I think, that may be shared by individuals and groups involved in campaigns, as Patricia Ferguson says, in, uh, across the country. But nevertheless, uh, this has been a consensual uh, process, as Claire Adamson suggested. Witnesses also raised with us concerns about the potential impact should HES achieve charitable status, as well as possible conflicts of interest, some notably the National Trust fear that charitable funding may be diverted away from others in the sector. And again, this is something that Parliament uh, and indeed the Minister uh, will need to keep a close eye on in the years ahead. For now, however, Deputy Presiding Officer, I conclude again by thanking those who helped the committee in our scrutinising role, uh, to the staff of both Historic Scotland and RCAMS for the work they do. Uh, and I pay tribute to what they and others involved in this field achieve collectively in conserving, enhancing and promoting our wonderful historic environment that delivers
there is so much for communities across Scotland and to our countries as a whole. I look forward to voting on this bill later on this afternoon and wish all those involved in the new body uh, well in their endeavours in the future. Thank you. Many thanks. We now move to closing speeches and I call on Liz Smith, who I can give quite a generous four minutes if you so wish. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary quite rightly spoke about the fact that uh, our cultural heritage uh, tells Scotland's story. And uh, Claire Adamson said in her contribution uh, just uh, how much that means in an educational uh, frame. I think uh, those of us uh, who were uh, able to take part in some of the visits organised uh, by Historic Scotland and by ARCAMS were extremely impressed, not just by the work that they were doing, but their outreach to other uh, educational uh, activities. In fact, I think one of the things that struck me most on some of these visits was just how much was happening with younger people. And I think, Cabinet Secretary, you, you said uh, some very wise words about the fact that there is a need to encourage that responsibility about the future to be able to understand what responsibility we all have, whether we are uh, young or a little older, in some cases, about uh, preserving and enhancing uh, what that cultural heritage actually means to all of us. And I think uh, Liam MacArthur has just made a, a very good point about the, the identity uh, of uh, the different cultural aspects that can really define a whole community. And I was very sorry that um, uh, at the time where the Orkney visit took place, it was a time where Mary Scanlon and myself uh, changed over. So Mary had the, the great benefit of visiting Orkney, but Orkney is somewhere where I've been twice before now. I really pay tribute to uh, all that they can do. And Liam MacArthur is absolutely right to say that this is happening day in, day out on so many different sites all around Scotland. And I think it's absolutely essential that we remember that and that, that when it comes to the overall strategic uh, vision, which I think we all hope uh, is better than uh, what has happened uh, before, uh, remembers that, because I think it's, it's a very good point uh, to make. And just to take up the point that uh, Patricia Ferguson made uh, in her contribution, uh, there is a need to ensure that the new body uh, is able to deliberate with all the other aspects uh, of cultural uh, interest. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, Patricia Ferguson has a good point when she says that they need a little bit of clarity. And I know that's not something you have to put in legislation, but it, it will be required in guidance, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And I think that's something that perhaps you uh, might like to refer to in your uh, closing remarks yourself. I think the uh, st national strategic uh, vision uh, that we have. Um, you spoke about the fact that it was a, a comprehensive vision and it's, while it's not new to have collaboration, it has brought together um, much more uh, perspective of how that will all come together. I think that's uh, hugely important. Uh, and uh, I, I just come back uh, to the point about the direction of that. I think it is absolutely crucial that all stakeholders within that vision really do buy into uh, the overall direction. And I think you know, it's inevitable that there will be some constraints. Many of them will be financial uh, when uh, these uh, bodies have to decide uh, how they're actually going to deliver what they're being asked to do. Uh, and that's where I think the issue of uh, ministerial uh, oversight uh, is going to be critical. And that, that transparency, I heard absolutely what you said about the safeguards in place. They are in place. But I think it would be helpful if we didn't actually get to that stage in the first place. We don't want these problems to arise. And that's where I think it's going to be uh, really uh, clear. Um, I think also we, we, we cannot underestimate the very specialist skills that are going to be involved uh, in taking the cultural heritage uh, forward in the future. I mean, some of the technology that was on uh, display in some of the visits that we went was just phenomenal. And I think we have to accept that um, th these, these are skills that will require very specialist training. Um, and I think when it comes to all the uh, arts uh, and crafts that go with uh, that cultural uh, environment, it is absolutely essential that we are training uh, the right uh, individuals with these appropriate skills, skills which I'm not sure that um, generations before have actually uh, had or perhaps in some cases known anything about. So that, that's a big challenge uh, to the new body. But overall, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, this bill is good, it's sound, uh, and so we will be very happy to support it at decision time. Thank you. Excellent. And I now call on Jane Baxter. Uh, generous five minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think I should be careful how I frame this point, but I'd like to begin by saying that I'm very pleased at the short nature of this debate today. I'll balance that by saying I believe it goes some way to demonstrate the careful consideration which has been given by the Committee and the Cabinet Secretary of the points raised at earlier stages of the Bill process. The Committee received some very detailed and thoughtful submissions in response to its call for evidence, 
And once again, I'd like to add my thanks to those individuals and organisations who have taken the time to engage so positively with the Bill as it's made its way through the Parliament. I'd also like to echo the tributes which have been made across the Chamber during this and other debates to the expertise and professionalism of the staff of both Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission on Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. I believe the Cabinet Secretary referred to this at Stage 1, and Claire Adamson repeated this today, as the skills and passion of those who are employed to protect and preserve our historic environment. It is to be hoped that neither the skill nor the passion will be lost by those working under the banner of the new organisation which will be created. When we last gathered in the Chamber to consider the Bill at Stage 1, the Cabinet Secretary indicated that she would be responding in detail to the Committee's Stage 1 report, and I felt that many of her responses were extremely helpful in clarifying the Scottish Government's position. And given my previous comments regarding the role of communities in caring for their historic environment, I was, of course, delighted to see that the Scottish Government accepts in principle this responsibility and to consider how Historic Environment Scotland can engage in community planning partnerships. Skills and passions for Scotland's history, landscape and its buildings run deep among professionals and amateur enthusiasts alike, and it's vital that we're able to capture that enthusiasm and make good use of it through effective community planning. Because it's absolutely vital that the rich cultural, industrial and environmental heritage which is preserved through our historic monuments and places remain open to everyone, no matter where they come from. <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, I grew up in the city and royal borough of Dunfermline. That means the fort by the crooked rivulet. And I still live there. And people who know me often refer to what they call my tour guide mode, which kicks in whenever someone who does not know the town is unlucky enough to get a lift in my car. They then get the whole potted history, coal mining, St Margaret, Robert the Bruce, Andrew Carnegie. But like many towns, the history of Dunfermline is not just in its famous people, its public buildings or its, its historic monuments. I well remember when I studied history at Queen Anne High School that the history teacher, whose name I don't remember, would take us out to discover the history of the town through its infrastructure, whether that was buildings, water courses or street names, names like Monastery Street, Foundry Street, East Port and Cold Road. I think this really helped to give us a sense of where we lived and how it came to be like that. And even all these years later, many of those buildings and features are still in evidence. What were formerly foundries and linen mills are now being developed for housing. The old fire station, dating from 1936, is to be a community arts centre. The town is evolving, and with careful management by the Council and the Carnegie Trust and a host of local organisations, it is still possible to recognise echoes of the traditions on which it was built, whilst catering for the social, leisure and business needs of visitors and residents alike. We must also preserve our historic environment for future generations, and it is important that the new body is fit for purpose and to meet the challenges of now and in the future. And on that point about challenges, there do remain some concerns out in the sector about proposals before us, and I note that the Built Environment Forum Scotland briefing highlighted a particular concern about the budget challenges being faced by local authorities and what impact this will have on those services tasked with managing the historic environment. The, Minister was, the Cabinet Secretary was clear at stage one that the new body will be empowered to support local authorities more effectively in their role as guardians of, his, of our historic environment. I do hope that this is the case, and I'd welcome some assurances from the Cabinet Secretary on this point. So in closing, I'd be keen to see very close monitoring of the new body in its early years, and to listen to stakeholders and those bodies it works in partnership with to make sure that it's fit for purpose. And I hope we can have a debate at some time in the future not on the challenges facing Historic Environment Scotland, but on its successes and achievements as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you have seven minutes or thereby. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jane Baxter referred to how short this stage three was. I, I think that was, it was a reflection of the very thorough process that has taken uh, place at, at all stages of this bill um, and the investment up front in thinking through the logic and the issues and indeed the role of the committee and really at stage one and previous to that, you know, really getting in about the issues and identifying them and addressing them. Uh, we all obviously recognise the importance of Scotland's rich historic environment, the need to protect 
project and to develop its potential. Uh, we are simply stewards, though, in the story that is Scotland, and so many of the stories uh, are about um, different parts, whether we're hearing from 8000 BC or indeed uh, for our industrial heritage. It's all part and parcel of that story of Scotland. Um, and it's clear that we've all taken to the heart the core message of the, the strategy, our place and time, making the most of what we have inherited must be a collective uh, effort. Uh, there is huge ambition and enthusiasm across Scotland. Uh, I've heard it in debates in this, this chamber, whether it's about Orkney from Liam MacArthur or indeed uh, the places across Scotland. And I expect Historic Environment Scotland working with the strategy framework to play a major role in unlocking that potential and continuing to promote um, that potential in all parts of Scotland. Um, in address Addressing uh, Patricia Ferguson's uh, point about the um, Historic Scotland Foundation, I am confident that it will be able to, uh, can and will work alongside Historic um, Environment Scotland on SCRAN. SCRAN is committed to work with Historic Environment Scotland while it develops its, its new relationship with the body and we expect uh, SCRAN to be part of HES, but of course for both. It's ultimately for the trustees of both of those charities to decide the way forward. But uh, we developed the bill mindful specifically of those two organisations. Uh, and I'm confident that the, the, the future will be certain and strong in working alongside and continuing the great work that they do. Um, Liz Smith uh, talked about the importance of evidence of people working together. I was very struck by the first meeting of the Historic Environment Forum bringing together all the different sectors, that people were pleasantly surprised uh, at the refreshing approach that did allow everybody around the table to have that, 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 that focus. She also spoke about the importance of learning and skills. Um, I specifically talked about the continual pre professional development of the staff with the uh, joint management team this morning. And indeed, uh, Jane Baxter will please know that um, I also spoke to them about community engagement because it's a key, key focus going forward. Um, in terms of uh, you know, what we can all consider, I, I, I was struck by Stuart Maxwell's challenge at stage one, that all members should consider what they can do to champion the historic environment in their own constituencies. And I'm increasingly seeing that happening um, from different members, uh, championing um, the, the opportunities and bringing themselves, working as facilitators, uh, bringing together different agencies in their own area. And it is our individual links which matter to the ordinary heritage as well as to the outstanding heritage. Uh, it's the local, however, that I'm sure everybody loves, that are passionate about and they're very proud about. And we have many iconic monuments, but there are many thousands of historic buildings and communities throughout the land, and someone loves each and every one of them, wants to see them cared for and sustainably used. And heritage um, derives life and value from the way we use it and wish to pass it on to succeeding generations. And in doing so, we enrich our own lives. And communities and individuals are ready and willing to play their part. Um, we've seen projects led by ARCAM, such as Scotland's Rural Past, tap into the rich resource of knowledge and commitment. And I'm delighted to see that approach reborn in the form of Scotland's urban past, with the support of Heritage Lottery Fund and Historic Scotland, which HES will take forward. As several uh, members have emphasised during the progress of the bill, it is vital that local as well as national expertise um, is developed and maintained. This cannot be an either-or or choice. So both national and local skills and knowledge are needed, and they must be deployed in harmony and not in opposition. And that is why I'm very pleased to hear that recognition of the, the vital work carried out by our local authorities in protecting and valuing our historic environment. And that's a key relationship going forward. And that joint working will be critical in taking forward the Town Centre First Principle, in which Derek Mackay will be leading a debate in this chamber um, later this afternoon. Joint working in the context of the historic environment is the focus of the strategy's working groups. This bill uh, makes some key improvements and more will be possible, but I want us to be agreed about what will work best before considering more radical changes. And historic... Yeah? I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. She'll recall the exchanges we had at, at stage two about the, the issue of councils gaining access to the expertise within uh, the new body. At that stage, I, I think for perhaps understandable reasons, um, she was reluctant to accept an amendment that would place that duty uh, on HES. But what um, reassurances can she give councils uh, that accept in those exceptional circumstances that access to um, guidance, um, expertise, etc. will be maintained going forward? Uh, I, I will give a, that reassurance because that is so important. Indeed, I've worked very well with Councillor Hagen in particular, who has the responsibility within COSLA, and we're in a far better footing now in our relationship with COSLA about how we can share that. But obviously, individual relationships in individual council areas uh, will continue, uh, and I expect that to, to, to carry on. Um, in terms of the bill, we're also proposing strategy changes in the bill to simplify protection and management, uh, much of which is handled by our local authorities, and that is an example of the work that will continue. And our aim 
must be to use the limited resources that we have of time, money and expertise to best effect. I want less spent time spent on bureaucracy by all parties, more cooperation, whether it's through owners of listed buildings or monuments, for applications or consents, or local authority conservation, uh, or indeed in other areas. Um, likewise, HES will uh, work with major and minor charities uh, throughout Scotland. I've had a very positive relationship with the National Trust for Scotland, mentioned a number of times during the debate about um, the way forward. Uh, but that work will also take place uh, with the smallest local charities as well. Um, it's important that rather than uh, competing, it is about collaboration and winning additional resources rather than just competing for existing ones. And I have reassured the committee on a number of occasions that the grant making that will be given to Historic Scotland Scotland, um, I will be specific about what they will have, um, and they will not be able to grant themselves funding. That will be a, a separate matter, so that separates out um, the concerns that people had about the grant elements. I would emphasise that despite reductions in uh, overall funding, we have managed to maintain grants. Uh, the debate we had about maintenance uh, couldn't happen if we didn't maintain the grant uh, uh, elements, and that's been a major achievement in, in, in this area. Um, and I also want to, to recognise the role that others have, HLF funding, for example, community-led projects. Uh, we must all work together. I said at the start of this bill that this was not about a cost-saving exercise. It was um, about making sure that we delivered a strategic a new body. We are on a journey in which we will recognise uh, uh, the full value of our potential of our historic environment. Um, I believe that we, that journey will, will move from what will government do for our heritage to what do we want to do for our heritage and how can government help us. And that is a journey uh, that is part of this government's wider vision for communities and individuals. Heritage is very much part of our, all our lives. So, Presiding Officer, Creating Heads will put in place one of the key foundations, along with the wider strategy, for a future in which our historic environment will flourish. And um, as we heard um, from uh, a number of members, it will also uh, realise the potential and release the potential for Scotland to flourish as well. So I, I thank you all in uh, supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That ends the debate on the historic...